You're listening to Write Write with the Story Perfect Editing Team. Visit us at www.storyperfectediting.com for more information on developmental editing, copy editing, and proofreading services for your writing. Season 1, Episode 4. Hello and welcome to Episode 4 of the Write Write Podcast with the Story Perfect Editing Services Team. Uh, my name is Elon. I am an apprentice editor at Story Perfect, and currently I'm drinking some uh, lemon mate tea to soothe my throat. Um, how about you, John? Uh, I'm John Robin. I am the senior editor and owner of Story Perfect, uh, and also overseer of the apprenticing program that we're just starting. Um, uh, today I'm drinking skim milk with ground flax, my dietary drink. <laughs> I have it every day. <laughs> So here's, here's the hell. <laughs> uh, I'm Katie. I'm a copy editor at Story Perfect. I am drinking beautiful carbonated caffeine. It's getting me through the day. Uh, so I need it to talk about today's topic. Yes, because today's topic is those pesky, pesky commas. And before we hop into that, I actually want to ask you guys what you are reading. If there's anything noteworthy out there. I'll start with mine, um, if you guys can't think of anything. Currently, I'm reading Calamity by Brandon Sanderson. It's the conclusion to his uh, Reckoners series. Um, It's very exciting. It's set in an alternate Earth where superheroes are all evil. That's awesome. (laughs) I am reading a super great book. I brought it here. It's a graphic novel for middle schoolers called Roller Girl about like a 12-year-old girl who doesn't really like that her friends like boys and so she finds a new thing to do with her time which is roller derby and it was it's really sweet and exciting and I wish I'd had it when I was 12. Right now I am reading uh, The Life Engineered by J.F. Dubow, uh, one of our one of our fellow Inkshares authors. Um, he, uh, yeah, I'm really liking the book. Uh, unfortunately the last two weeks I uh, took on a very uh, tight deadline editing projects, so my reading time has slowed down, but I'm getting back into it, and I just love uh, love the the pacing and some of the some of the choices he's making in his story. So yeah, I don't want to say too much to spoil it for anyone. Um, if you want to read a review of it that I wrote, go to the Warbler. Uh, mm-hmm. It's my blog. Uh, <laughs> review JF's book. But uh, yeah. I also want to add, I just finished uh, Jim McDaniel's uh, An Unattractive Vampire, which is another one of the story uh, story one of, another one of the Ink Shares uh, Nerdist or Ink Shares Sword and Laser winners, and that book was outstanding. It was a ton of fun to read. It was really great. funny. Um, great characters, just super awesome pacing. Uh, without spoiling anything, I will say that my favorite two moments in the book, um, he does these footnotes throughout that are just kind of like running commentary and like jokes and just additions. And one of them just says, elsewhere, a very happy sea sponge was born. And that just made me smile. Um, <laughs> and the other is That's like, great. during this climactic fight scene, everyone stops fighting in the middle to talk about their favorite TV show. <laughs> stuff like that it's a hilarious book i highly recommend reading it um it's available on amazon now um so yeah definitely check out oh. an unattractive vampire if you get a chance now that's channeling scooby-doo i think it's, that it's reminds true. me of scooby-doo how they just right in the middle of the fight they all stop and have a little conversation <laughs> that's great <laughs> but what happens when this guy and this yeah. lady get together oh my god <laughs> i'm pro hijinks <laughs> Yeah, it's it's totally outrageous. Um, okay, so let's let's hop back into the topic. We are talking today about commas, and I happen to think that commas can be rather pesky because um, they're they're difficult uh, difficult to use. But John said something beautiful about them uh, right before we hit record. Here was that they can be wonderful things. Um, they don't have to be a pain. And so what we're going to do in this episode is tell you what we know about commas and maybe some pitfalls to avoid, and just sort of get into and into the dirty with those pesky pesky commas. Um, I guess to start, let's just define it at its most basic. This is the dictionary definition of a comma. It is a punctuation mark that is used to separate words or groups of words in a sentence. Fairly oh, that's easy. Just do that then. Yeah, just yeah. separate words. I, just, but like, I which words do you separate? Just do that then. Just which whatever words? you want, you know. <laughs> comma after every word. That's that makes the editor work harder and earn their yeah. money. <laughs> yeah. So I guess so I guess what we can do is we can start asking some kind of basic questions about the comma. Um, do you guys have anything that you want to like add about like what what can can you like 
at, at its core, what do you think a comma is best for? Like, it, it's a really weird question, but, like, people, we know what they're for on this intuitive level, but I think oftentimes we've, just like, in the act of writing, we forget how to use them properly. I mean, personally, I like to think of them as, as something that separates thoughts, but doesn't necessarily separate sentences. Um, this can be problematic because when you, because, um, when you are writing, sometimes when you pause to think, you tend to add in commas. Mm -hmm. Like I used to do that all through college, just like a comma, every place I stopped to think about life. Um, but I do think that they do tend outside of like lists, they tend to separate, um, ideas within a sentence mm -hmm. or like actions just like sort of work as like separators a lot of the time. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. For me, I like to think of the comma, like ultimately, at the end of the day, it helps you to um, nail down on something that could be ambiguous. Because sometimes, you know, like there's a there's a popular book called Eats, Shoots, and Leaves. I and, love that uh, book. It, yeah, it's a great book because, you know, if, if you put... Um, if you put no commas in that, it's it could be talking about. Uh, I think there's like a uh, it's like a panda on the a panda on the front. Yeah. Yeah. So you know they're eating shoots and leaves. Whereas if you put commas, it could be somebody at a bar. They eat, they shoot, and then they leave. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the meaning changes. The and moment. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so sometimes, like I find the comma is such a such a nuanced uh, punctuation mark. There are so many rules, so many things to know. And, it, and I feel like it's a little bit of an art. It, it goes beyond just a simple technical, because you have to know all, like, if you're an artist, you have to know all the techniques. Yeah. But then in the, at the moment, you have to make a choice saying, does this belong here, does this not? And, and there are times where the technical manual would say, put a comma here. And I'll opt not to, because the sentence context and the setup, there's no ambiguity. So yeah. it's kind of like wearing a belt with your suspenders. You don't need it. And in yeah. terms of readers... That comma not being there lets them read faster. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like, that's like mentally you insert a pause every time. That's yeah. right. Um, yeah. yeah. Which I, is I, why it works to separate ideas, but if you don't want them separated, then that's a good point, John. Like, putting that comma there can uh, affect the reader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And affect your in intentions, for sure. I also right. have to think about uh, how your book is read aloud. Uh, I've heard audiobook narrators say, that they treat commas as a one-second pause, periods as a two-second pause, and uh, carriage returns as a three-second pause, even though they don't like actually hold it for that long. So like, if you imagine as you're writing, do you want someone to pause for that long while they're reading it? Do you consider right. putting in a comma? I think one of the yeah. things that um, I... So I'm, I'm taking a, copy editing, a set of copy editing courses at UC Berkeley right now, um, and one of the things that, that, uh, that I found so interesting about learning about commas is this idea of um, like coordinating clauses, like um, and like so comma splicing, which is a thing that a lot of people have heard about but don't exactly know how it works. Um, yeah, it's. It, can you guys explain that? As the apprentice, I don't want to hop in there too, <laughs> too aggressively. I mean, I am not a fan of comma splices, because um, I think. I don't know. Maybe, John, do you want to start with like an explanation of what a comma splice is before we well, jump yeah. into opinion? Comma splice is essentially a comma acting where a period or a semicolon should have been. So you have two separate yeah. ideas that really should be two sentences. Yeah, um, that's why I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Now, the, the one thing I've heard about uh, comma uh, splices where they are tend to be OK is in dialogue where di things yeah, are a little yeah. bit more lax and informal. No, so when I'm exactly editing... Right. I will I leave a comma splice sometimes inside dialogue. It depends. I mean, if there's yeah. sort of an urgency or a quickness in the, in the rhythm and how they're speaking, yeah. it's fine. There are times where I'll, where I'll choose to use a period. But that's, again, where it becomes an art, yeah. the, the choice. Yeah, well, of, and dialogue is the biggest part of, like, where these grammar rules sort of uh, get real wishy-washy. Mm -hmm. Because you have to think about, like, the way people speak is in full sentences. So trying to apply, like, proper structure and grammar... Mm -hmm. to something that's just like yeah i had fun like it doesn't always make sense like you can add all the proper grammar but then that can also affect the reader so then yeah, it's just to like to maintain the, the analogy with fine art like if you if you're drawing a, like an architectural uh schematic um and you want to use lines they'd better be like really right. precise and clean lines but if you're doing a piece of abstract art 
you can totally be free form with lines. You can change the defin you can change exactly. the parameters of what a line actually is. Um, and and fiction is absolutely in this space where um, you. But 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 at the same time, like to, to sorry to, to to go back a couple of steps, um, the reason why fine art and then you know modern art can be um, so far out, and a lot of people just are like, well, that's just like a blue canvas. Why why is why does that get counted as art? The reason is because the person yeah. who made it has the technical ability to do all the stuff that leads up to this interpretation mm -hmm. of color, and so you yeah. can't just like be totally free with it. It's knowing the rules and knowing when to break them. Yeah, so if I was reading something, if I was editing something, and they were using comma splices everywhere, like, I would certainly change many of them. Um, because I think, in the case of comma splices, there's usually just a better grammatical structure available, whether that be a semicolon or an M dash, or just, like, sometimes just rearranging it so that it's not at the end of the sentence, it's in the beginning, or mm -hmm. something like that. There's usually a better option. Mm -hmm. Um Dialogue is the exception, but again, even if I saw it in the dialogue over and over again, I probably will still change a lot of them, just so there's not a repetitive grammatical structure to the dialogue, because mm -hmm. um, I find that distracting as a reader. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder how reading Yoda is. <laughs> <laughs> That, that, well, as long as it's consistent. Yeah, yeah as long as it's consistent. And maybe if you uh, if you know like Asian based languages where this you know like everything's different, then it wouldn't bother you at all. Yeah, if, if you know a uh, subject verb object order is not a hard and fast rule. Yeah. Um, in exactly. like a heavily morphological language like Russian, there are no mm -hmm. word orders because um, you can. Because you who just, cares? You Russia. Just, like add morphemes to describe what is the object and what is the subject, and you can say it in whatever order you want. It's totally yeah. unreal. Um, That's what I like about Russian. I don't speak a word of Russian, <laughs> but I know that. Um, <laughs> thanks, college. Uh, so, so I guess like t talking about fiction, um, and this is something that I've struggled with always. Um, do we always need a comma before inline dialogue? Do we always? Is that a rule? Is that like a hard and fast rule? Because uh, like... give me an example. So, like you know, you're you're writing. Um, he he turned to the right and said, "Hey, what's over there to the right?" Uh, I I err on yes. I mean, that's the way I, I do edit it that way um, because I think that in fiction it's really helpful if the formatting isn't doing it for you. Then what's dialogue and what's exposition needs to be separated. Yeah. And again, that's the comma working as a separator. Like, here's the exposition and here's the dialogue afterward. Um, so in that sort of scenario, I think, yes. Um, you know, that's, I do edit with it there. Uh, or sometimes a colon, depending on context. I think, I think colons For, are, like, really, un, like, they, they remain pretty unused in fiction. Yeah. They, they do, but I like them. If you're we presenting, if there's the episode. feel that you're presenting something, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. it's... It would be interesting to talk more about punctuation because there's, you know, a lot of things tend to fall by the wayside in, in modern fiction, like the yeah. parentheses, and, or yeah. they just get mixed up, M dashes, parentheses, colons, semicolons, yeah. commas. We're going to talk about, I know, semicolons in our next episode, but, yeah. you know, while we're talking about them, there, there's just so many, they're, they're just like a tool bag of, uh, they're an <laughs> of it, tricks. Semicolons are an amazing thing. Uh, yeah. Well, people and most people just that. use the comma in place of all of those things we were just talking about, which is sort mm -hmm. of like the, why the comma is so popular, but also why it's so very misunderstood and can be pesky to people is because it's doing jobs it wasn't originally meant to do. And it's adapted over time so that we allow it to do things it didn't yeah. originally do. Like I love um, M dashes and I, and I rely on them heavily too. in all of my writing. Yep. Um, me too. <laughs> but but people often people. use commas to serve that purpose of like an interjective or whatever. Um, right. And yeah, and I think that's that's the art part coming in. You know, when you're interpreting, what happens is this a, an abrupt interjection, mm -hmm. or is this just a you know a um, subordinate clause that you know you're adding to the main yeah the main sentence. So yeah. I guess what we're coming to is this really interesting idea that that grammar is. Is, is kind of a major player. Um, like, grammatical decisions make are really important in fiction. Um, they're really important in writing in general, but I think people place a lot of value on 
things outside of the scope of like very straightforward concepts like grammar and word choice. Um, I'm reading this book right now called Reading Like a Writer. Um, and it's, mm-hmm. it's very good. And one of the things that it talks about is like this notion of deliberate word choice and paying very close attention to word choice because of how much, you know, uh, how much additional information is contained within the words that weren't chosen. Um, yeah. in the specificity. And I mean, I don't know, personally, I don't think that hard about every word that I put into a piece of fiction, but the words that count, I do think rather hard about. I know when it's the wrong word and I know that I'm looking for the right word. Um, and I think the same is very true of a grammatical choice, like an M dash versus a comma or a comma versus a semicolon. And so knowing those rules yeah. more effectively or, you know, more closely can lead to you expressing something much clearer to a reader. Yeah. Well, and what some people may not realize is that like as a copy editor specifically, like when I'm, when I'm reading through and I see those choices, I can usually tell whether they're intentional or they're misunderstood. Like I can tell if you use the semicolon, but you meant a comma. Um, or if you put that semicolon there because you wanted to connect these two independent clauses. Like uh, it's part of my job is to read into the author's intent. Um, and I'm not saying that that's easy. And, and it doesn't, you know, I'm not going to be right 100% of the time. I make my choices. But, uh, you know, I can usually tell when something is there by mistake or misunderstanding as opposed to intent which is why, as we're talking, this, this grammatical aspect is so important, and that's why it's important that your editor is like on board with your style mm-hmm. and understands your choices. Um, yeah, you know, because really otherwise you could end up with a really mm-hmm. bland grammatical structure that maybe you didn't want, maybe you wanted something that stood out more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's one thing that makes copy editing a time uh, a time intensive process. Um, I mean, sure. developmental editing can definitely be up there <laughs> if there's a lot of thought and a lot of con- a lot of a uh, lot of stuff to question. But I mean, with copy mm-hmm. editing, although you're doing mostly inline changes, you have there's the, you have to stop and think about a lot of things. It's like, do I use an m dash? Do I use a comma? Well, what's exactly. happening? Here? It's that it's that little bit of thinking that you add that up and everywhere it's not a quick yeah. matter of oops they missed a comma or oops misspelled that word it's you know yeah. i added time with that yeah well and even something to consider too in fiction is um the narrative voice so something that's in first person like i was talking about this book roller girl it's first person and she's 12 so i'm probably not going to see any semicolons even though grammatically they might make sense if she's saying i went to the park i skated there's no need for a semicolon there because it doesn't suit the voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's still a decision that has to be made by the copy editor and by the writer. Like, it can throw off people. Your, if your intended audience is 12, maybe don't put in mm-hmm. semicolons even yeah, though they yeah, belong. Totally. If you're writing YA maybe. and younger, just like... Yeah, yeah. maybe just that's why a comma commas splice... Heavily. Yeah, maybe that's where a comma splice uh, can work better. Is yeah. not only in dialogue, but in a first person that's immature... Because we see a lot of, like, these young adult, uh, you know, there's, like, a young adult super hot right now, and a lot of them are first person, 15, 16, 17. You have to take grammatical structure into account, because if you're seeing something really complicated there, it might throw you out of the voice. Yeah, I mean, that's why run-on sentences are more acceptable in, in that kind of a form. Um, exactly. We are, we are at about 15 minutes, so I'm going to stop us real quick for our short uh, advertisement um, before we hop back into our closing thoughts about the comma. Um, and today we're going to talk about ourselves again because this podcast is brought to you by us. Um, so we are a story perfect editing services and we are very excited to be available as a group of editors for, uh, for your short fiction, for your novels, for your whatever. Um, and I want to talk specifically out there to the growing number of authors who are going to be published through Inkshares on the Quill imprint. Um, the Quill imprint is a great opportunity to get your work out there, but one of the things about Quill is that they don't offer you editing services the way they would with a full Inkshares publication. Um, and, you know, we obviously believe in the power of editing. Um, so does the entire world of publishing. And so we urge you to get in touch. Um, and, you know, maybe you don't need developmental editing services. Maybe you think you just need a proofread. Whatever it is, we're happy to help you with uh, with your Quill book. And we're, uh, we are available. You all know John, so... You can trust <laughs> trust in John's power. Um, drop me a line. Drop you, all, a line. you all are in touch with me. So. Visit us at uh, storyperfectediting.com. Right? Storyperfectediting.com? That's the website? Storyperfectediting.com. Yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> <laughs> I yep. know that. I recorded the intro, too. Uh, yep. 
<laughs> so, so back to commas. Um, is there? It sounds. It sounds like I had this one question in our in our notes that said, uh, "When is a comma a period? When is it a colon? When is it a semicolon? When is it an m dash?" But it sounds, based yeah. on the conversation that we've had leading up to this, that it's really a, It's a, It's more subtle than than a, than a clearly defined. Uh, there's there's yeah. no clear delineation between when a comma is one of these things and when it's another. I mean, it's so much about intent. I think. Um, some t some authors do this just as a force of habit. They just put commas instead of periods so they can keep writing more quickly So they because they just type all at once and they just get it all out. So I do see a lot of commas instead of periods. Like if, they're, if they already have a really, like a full complex sentence that has, you know, two independent clauses in it, I am much more likely to, to replace that comma with a period and start a new sentence. Um, you know, because you don't want commas sort of connecting like a hundred independent clauses. You know, it's, if it's already a long sentence, then yeah. length has some, has a factor. You don't want just a 250 in... word sentence filling an entire page kind of a thing. Exactly. Yeah, usually that's a point at which you either turn it into multiple sentences or you even might question that whole sentence and say, do you right. need all this information? Yeah. Is it all, you know, because for a reader, that's a lot to take in. I mean, every sentence you read, you're pushing something into your mind yeah. and yeah. ideally you should feel like you're immediately there in the story following along as soon as yeah. you have to stop and reread a sentence and say That's okay it. so that comma went from here to here so that goes you know you're starting to analyze what you're reading yeah, and you're exactly. not in the story anymore a yeah is exactly like a single unit that you process and if it's a long and sort of unwieldy comma filled sentence it becomes dif more difficult to parse out what's taking place in the story because you're like like you mm -hmm. said you're trying to organize all this information as it's coming in um, and in my experience, sometimes like an entire independent clause can be replaced with like an adjective. Yeah. You know, it's just sometimes that the, the writers want to tell us so much. Um, and you, you have to do a little bit of that editing for them. That's what you're there for. But yeah, I think sometimes just, um, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to talk about semicolon, but when is it a semicolon is when those ideas are really connected and the author wants them to be connected then that comma is a semicolon. But on the other side of that semicolon, they have to be full sentences and independent clauses and that sort of thing. So like, if they're related and the author wants them to clearly look related to each other, then that comma is a semicolon. But generally, I like to just rearrange them into you know happy little sentences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, short sentences tend to serve, just in my experience, generally writing short sentences tend to just serve me much more effectively. Um, it's a technique that I learned in writing marketing copy. Um, you opt for short sentences um, and it changes the pacing of whatever you're writing. Like it's a much faster mm -hmm. paced thing if there are short sentences. So if you want something to feel more like a slog, definitely. Or if you want to space something out, longer sentences. But I find that short sentences, like even if you're talking like moment to moment and a second is passing and you're taking two pages to pass that second, it can feel very fast if you're using short, you know, uh, like a short mm -hmm. sentence structure. Um, I mean, I just helped someone get their manuscript from like 130,000 words down to like 80,000. Wow. I mean, because there was just so much there. She wanted us to be there for every second of every every moment with characters. And I'm like, it's got to go. I'm bored. Yeah. Like, I don't need to know what they had for breakfast. Sorry. Yeah, like, that you, that'll that show up in the fan fiction, okay? Like, yeah. just... One page. <laughs> one page of what they ate. One page of very well of the described. pea soup. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. Um, so, Do we want to talk about the Oxford comma at all before I, we... I would or... like to talk about the Oxford comma. Because um, it is a subject of great debate for no reason. I, I'm not sure I get the controversy. Well, um, most but... people, most sane, you know, like, evolved humans think that the Oxford comma is the way to go. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I mean, we should talk about what it is. When, when you have a list of things, um, you know, like red, green, and blue. That's your list of things. They're in a sentence, and you have a comma after red and a comma after green. Or a comma after red, and you don't necessarily need a comma after green unless there's an ambiguity there. So, for instance, if we say red, comma, green, comma, and blue, you know that that's three separate colors. But if you say red, comma, green, and blue, it might mean that it's red, and then something is green and blue. And so there is an ambiguity there, and the Oxford comma is that last comma before the and. The, the ultimate or, separator. The ultimate <laughs> separator. That's a beautiful and very epic way of describing it. 
Um, <laughs> but there is like a weird controversy where people like they swear by the Oxford comma or they, you know, they don't like the Oxford comma for whatever reason. Um, but it's, I, in my experience, it's much safer to just use it rather than not use it. Um, uh, agreed. But the- I'm, I'm for it. I edit using it um, because I do think that it, especially in fiction where we're like, you know, it can help. But the only exception I would say is that when we're talking about comma-heavy sentences, yeah. right? If you have a comma-heavy sentence and you're adding an Oxford comma and they have, let's say, parenthetical commas earlier in the sentence, then the reader will be confused. You're looking because at a sentence that has, you know, like... Too many commas. 15 or 16 so then, words and eight commas, and you're like, what? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> but that's not so much a problem with the Oxford comma as it is with just, like, rearranging that entire sentence. Yeah. Um, but that's a time when you might think, if you're looking at your sentence and you're thinking, like, gosh, is this too many commas? The answer is yes. Yeah, every time. <laughs> like, if you're thinking it, <laughs> then it's happening. <laughs> cool. It's definitely too yeah. many. My usual rule with the Oxford comma, I mean, I look at what the author's already done, because mm-hmm. if they, let's say they have, haven't used the Oxford comma anywhere, then everywhere I run into a list, i got to add it in. Uh, yeah. So if if they've consistently not used it, then I'll keep to what they've because it's an optional thing. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's not a hard and fast rule, and and some books you'll see it consistently there, some books you'll see it not there. And I think for the reader, if the reader sees consistently that the third item in a list is not there, they're less likely to think, well, is it is it red and blue or is it red, comma, and blue, right? Is, there, is it three different things or is it two things and it's red and blue mixed together? You know, like, I think yeah. if you're used to not seeing that third comma, you're going to assume that the thing after the and yeah. uh, is it. Or it could be and. I guess any fanboy. So for uh, or not well, and or I don't know if that works with all fanboys. I know those I know those come in with um, with uh, semi semicolons yeah. which we'll talk about but anyway i know i've seen lists with and and or for sure i'd have yeah, to yeah. think through it's it mostly it's... and and or although yeah. i think there are cases when it can apply to others but mm-hmm. and and or are the big ones yeah for yeah sure. yeah that makes a lot of sense um so we're just about out of time but i want to i want to end the episode about these commas with a question to you both um if you could shake every writer in the world at the same time and yell one thing at them about the comma, what would it be? Uh, I would probably yell, the comma is not a period. (laughs) 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 I think that's what I would yell, because that's what I see most often, uh, is just where some some writers, and, and it's not, you know, and you're just anyone who's just, you know, people writing tend not to think about this sentence and this thought is over. I'm going to start a new one. They just sort of stream of consciousness into a bunch of commas. And, uh, and you know, as a copy editor, that makes a lot of work for me. That's, that's like really easy that I know that they are capable of. It's not like I'm doing something they can't. It's just something that they didn't think to do, which is fine. But I would tell them, if I could talk to them before I picked up the work, I would say, go through and make sure none of your commas are periods. It would save them some money, probably. Mm-hmm. I would like. I was. It's funny because that's kind of what I was. What I was thinking of saying, but uh, I wanted to think about this one because I find a frustration for me is often trying to explain when to use a comma, mm-hmm. and it seems that because it's such a nuanced thing, um, I my my thing for writers would be. Read up on commas. I mean, you don't have to read up on all grammar in the universe. Just go and get a Chicago Manual of Style and read the rule section on commas because yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not. You're you're yeah. a writer. This is your profession, uh, and uh, you know editors. That's definitely something where we're like co-pilots. We're going to be there checking to make sure everything's consistent. But you can save yourself a lot of money if you uh, are getting all your. I mean. You know, while you're at it, might as well read the whole thing. But definitely the commas, because it's such a commonly um, uh, misunderstood and and thing that where where it's spent yeah. a lot of time in editing goes into that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. and then they don't have to worry about it when they're writing. They can free themselves up to worry more about writing and less about. Because I know I've gotten stuck when I'm writing. Like, does the comma go here? Does the comma not go here? 
And like the more verse you get with commas, then the less you have to stop and worry about that stuff. Yeah, you can... the better you are with your grammar, the more fluid your writing will be because you can really, you can be so specific even as you're like writing a first draft. You can really exactly. get into this granular nuance using using grammar. Yep. <laughs> Um, well, that that's going to wrap up this episode about commas. I want to thank you both for uh, for joining me for this episode. Uh, thank you to our thank listeners. Thank you. Uh, we yeah, thank you very much, you guys sticking around for our fourth episode. Um, and uh, stay tuned. Next month, we're going to be talking about semicolons. And uh, that just about does it for this episode. So see you next time.